Today, as we, as we celebrate Easter, I want to take you to the book of Ruth. Uh, it's this little book hidden in the Old Testament, and um, it's a beautiful story of redemption. And if you can go there with me, I'm going to look at Ruth, Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3. I've been going through this study um, in the last month or so um, with a group we meet every, every morning at 7 a.m. on Zoom. Uh, if you're interested in a morning Bible study, please let us know about that. But um, we got into this book of Ruth, and it, it just unfolded once again for me in my heart uh, when it comes to God's plan of redemption. Um, while you've heard the story, and you're going to hear more about it, that, that Jesus rose again, uh, you're going to hear today, it's amazing how from Genesis all the way through the end of the book of Revelation, where Jesus is our Redeemer. Uh, some may think that the Old Testament is irrelevant in the day we live in. I'm about to prove to you this morning it's very timely. Amen? Very relevant. And so in Ruth chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and we're going to go down through verse 14. And this is a story about a woman named Naomi and Ruth. And so then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, and I'm kind of jumping in. This is about halfway through the book. And I'll catch you up on the rest of it. But she says, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now, Boaz, who, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing or he's, he's, uh, he's sifting the barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor but do not make yourself known to the men until he is finished eating. And then it shall be when he goes to lie down that you shall take notice of the place where he lies down and you will go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her mother, Naomi, her mother-in-law, Naomi, all that you say to me, I will do. And so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was cheerful, and he went to lie down on a heap of grain. And she came and uncovered his feet and laid down at his feet. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself and said, and, and there a woman was laying at his feet, and he said, Who are you? And she says, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative." And then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after other men, rather, whether they be rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that he, will, that he will perform the duty of a close relative for you and, and be good. Let, if, let me read that again. Stay this night, and in the morning, if he shall perform the duty of a close relative for you, good. Let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning. And so we see here the story, and it might sound confusing just taking it out of that context, but in this story, we have several, there are several characters in this story. Number one, there's the land of Israel. We'll see here in this story how that there was a family led by a father named Elimelech. Elimelech was married to a woman named Naomi, and they had two sons. And they, there was a time of famine that came upon Israel. And as a result of it, Elimelech would move his family out of God's promised land into another land, a godless land. And so in this, we would see that Naomi would hear that God has revisited Israel and she would now want to move back to the promised land. And so in this case here, Israel is considered, like to, like to Naomi, a promised land, our promised land is considered to be heaven. Just like their promised land was a real place, heaven is a real place. Turn to your neighbor and say it. Heaven is a real place. 
It's a real place. John, or Jesus even said to his disciples in John chapter 14, he said, don't worry or surrender to your fear for you've believed in God, now also believe in me. My father has many dwelling places or many mansions. If it were otherwise, I would tell you plainly because I go to prepare a place. Say that with me, a place. I go to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am and you already know the way to the place where I'm going. How many of you know Jesus right now, the Bible says he's preparing a place for us. Amen? It's a real place. It's more real than, 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 the, than, than my hand in front of my face. It is tangible. It is real. He says, I've gone away, but I'm coming back. How many of you know Jesus is coming back? Amen? He's coming back. And he's coming back to bring heaven. And so... I love this, and the title of this series is called Making Space. If you're here today, I'm going to tell you something. God has made space for every one of us. There is room at his table. There's room in his kingdom. How do I know this? The word tells us in John 3.16, you know the, the scriptures well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I love another translation that says, everyone who believes in him will not perish but experience everlasting life. Do you realize that when God sent his son, he sent his son for the whole world, not just a generation of people, not just a certain people group, not just a certain social status, but rather he sent it for every individual who would ever call upon his name. And so we have this promised land ahead of us, but there is a place in in this story, a place called Moab. Israel is a picture or a, a type of heaven. Moab is a picture and a type of the world. Today's world, in fact, King Solomon would say it this way, there is nothing new under the sun. In other words, they were experiencing things then that we are experiencing things now. It may be new to us, but it's not new to God. There are things happening in humanity right now, happening in our society, that we may think, wow, I, I wouldn't believe it if I had not seen it. And yet we see that, that even in, in, in Ruth's world of Moab, it was a godless society. It was a society that did not know God. When Elimelech moved his family, Naomi and his two sons, uh, they w- the two sons would marry two women of Moab. One was named Orpah, the other named Ruth. And, and, but they lived in a world that was much like the world we live in today. How do I know this? Again, they were, there was a go- it was a godless society. Um, you know, in our day that we live in, uh, I would say this, the last three years has not done well for the, for the family. It's not done well. We've seen in the last three years, especially since this pandemic, everything, every weakness, everything that, uh, that would want to attack family has just been compounded and magnified. Some would say this, and I would say this, and I should have prefaced this at the beginning of my message, I believe that we are living in the best days. I believe that we're living in the best times. If ever you wondered if the Bible was true, If you ever wondered if the Bible was on target or relevant, just look at the things around you. Just see the fulfillment of God's word taking place before your very eyes. I think that we live, some would say this, that we are living in the best of times as well as the worst of times. In other words, that while while there may be things falling apart around us in our society, yet God is moving in profound ways. I felt a shift, I sensed a shift take place even as early as January, in the first weeks of January, where I felt in my heart, in my spirit, this is going to be a very good year. Does that mean it would be a year with no trouble? No. A year of no uh, maybe hardship or uh, things that would push back? No. But the Bible says this, where sin abounds, the grace of God does much more abound. And we see here even in the land of Moab, Things that we're dealing with today, and I'm just going to read you a few statistics. One of the things, and this has been going on for a long time, but 
But one of the things in a godless society is when we experience fatherlessness, fatherless homes. I think you can affirm when I, when I read these off, you're like, yes, I know that to be true. In, a, in, a, in our own society here in America, one in four children in the U.S. are living in a single-parent home, a fatherless home. That's 18 million children. 63, 63% of youth suicides are attributed to fatherless homes. 90% of homelessness is attributed to fatherless homes. 85% of children with uh, behavioral disorders are attributed to fatherless homes. High school dropout, 71% attributed to fatherless homes. Kids in juvenile prison, 70% from fatherless homes. Even drug abuse, 75% attributed to fatherlessness. We live in a nation, we live in a society of orphans, of fatherlessness. This is the society that even Ruth in her day was experiencing. Even, so it's just not just fatherlessness or, the, or fathers, but even motherhood and womanhood. While we are all created equal, there's this drive in our society to be the same. But God has designed us and made us wonderfully and beautifully different. Amen? In other words, we are unique. We don't, it's not, a, it's not society says you got to be the same, but God says, no, I made male and female. I made you different for a reason. I made you different for a purpose. We are unique. We are different. We each have our different function and different role in the family. But the enemy would want to convince us to do each other's jobs, to take each other's roles. But God says, no, I've made you just the way you are. And when you come together, you are powerful. Amen? True unity comes out of diversity, not out of sameness, not out of just saying, well, we're the same, but rather out of diversity. And then our children uh, in, the, in the society we live in today, our kids don't know their true purpose, whether it's by the clothes we wear, the friends we have, the job. You know, there is just so much, uh, there are so many issues facing our kids today that it's all the result of not knowing God, not knowing our identity. In a godless society, men and women lose sight of identity and purpose, but only God can give us purpose. Amen? Amen. And so this is, the, this is the world that Ruth lived in. This is the world that we live in. And so Ruth in this story represents the unbeliever. And she was living among unbelievers. Can you imagine a world without God? Imagine a society without God. And this is the life she lived. But then one day there came a family from the nation of Israel into Moab one day there came a man named Elimelech and Naomi and two sons, and these two sons would introduce or bring this, this knowledge of God into Moab that Ruth and Orpah had never heard of before. They're like, who is this God? Who is this living God? And she, for the first time, she would be, she would be introduced to a living God who loved them and provided for them and was kind to them and was faithful to them. And the word says that once Elimelech came, though, that we don't know what the time frame was, but after Elimelech had moved his family into, into Moab, he died. And then his two sons went on to marry these two women. Can you imagine Naomi's dilemma? Can you imagine what she might have been feeling or going through at the time? She's like, my husband, we have br we've brought our family here, and now he's gone. And now Naomi is beginning to hear that there is a visitation of God back in Israel, back in her home country. You know, there may be some of you here today, and I know being Easter, there's a lot of people that are coming today. Um, and maybe you once attended church. Maybe you once uh, for a season were part of a family, but have moved out of or you dismissed yourself, maybe because of dryness or dullness, or maybe 
even hurt by something in the church, and you're here today, and you're saying, God, I, I'm hearing that you're doing something in the body of Christ. I'm here that you're visiting your people. I hear that you're showing your goodness. I'm here that you're show, I hear that you're showing your kindness once again. I'm hearing that you're moving in the earth today. And with that being said, I just want to welcome you back. I just want to welcome you to where God is moving. And that's what was happening in the life of Naomi was that she heard that God was moving in Israel and she's saying, God, I just want to go back home. I just want to go back to my family. And so there was a day, the Bible says, that she made a decision and she says, I'm going home. Now, can you imagine what Ruth would have felt the day she heard that her mother-in-law decided to make a trip back home. I imagine for Naomi or for Ruth, there was probably just a moment of panic, a moment of like, wait a minute, um, there's something in you that I've never seen before. There's something in, your, in, in my husband that I've never seen before. There's something in this family that I've never been introduced before. By this time, the Bible says that even Ruth and Orpah's husbands had died. And now is left just Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah. And the Bible says in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 6, it says, She arose with her daughters and her daughters-in-law that she might return to the, from the country of Moab, that she might, that she has heard, uh, so, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on their way to the land of Judah. And Elimelech comes. He brings his sons. They marry. Elimelech and his sons die, leaving a widow wife, Naomi, leaving two daughter-in-laws. Now they're at a point, do we stay here or do we go back to Israel? And the word says that Naomi made a decision, I'm going back. And she told her two daughter-in-laws, in essence, if you want to go with me, that's all right. But she told them, I would ask you if you want to stay. She said, if you don't have to go with me. You don't have to go back. You're not from Israel. You don't know Israel. You don't know what is there. But the word says that in the process of going, that Orpah kissed Naomi and went back to the world. But, Na but Ruth said, no, I want to go with you. She would even pray this prayer in verse 16. She would say to Ruth, like, she would say, urge me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And wherever, and your people shall be my people and my God, your God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. For the Lord, do so to me and more so. If anything would, but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she had determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. So they're on their way back to Israel. Naomi says to the daughters, you don't have to go with me, you can stay. One would stay and one would go. I'm here to tell you this morning that God gives every one of us a choice. We all have a choice whether we're gonna stay in our condition, whether we're gonna stay in Moab, stay in a, in, a, in a godless context, or we're going to say, God, no, I want to go with you. Jesus, even the New Testament, he never forced himself on anybody. Let me say it this way. He never chased after anybody. He would rescue the one that was looking for help. But if anybody decided on their own to say, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore, he would not chase after them. Why? Because God has given us each a choice. In the case of Naomi, who is a picture of the Holy Spirit of God working in our lives, she said, you have a choice. You can stay or you can go. And Ruth would say, I want to go. And so they get, to, they get to Moab, or they get to Israel, and the word says that the next day, after they, they found a place to live, remember, they had come from there. They had found a place to live. The reason, one of the reasons why they moved was this, was because Elimelech, in essence, had to sell his property. He had, because of the famine, 
he had to do something, and so he sold his property. So now when they're coming back, they have no property. They have no home of their own. But the word says they moved in, and all the city heard about it. And the word says that the next day, Ruth got up, and she said, I'm going to go out and find food. This was during harvest time. In fact, it was happening this time of year, March, April, harvest time in Israel. And she would go out into the fields, and she didn't know where she was going. But the word says that she happened to come upon the field of Boaz. She didn't know who Boaz was. All she saw were people out in the fields harvesting. And that day, it was the, it was the law of God that when you harvested grain, that you left some behind for the poor. And so she's coming around, picking up what she can find. And the word says that Boaz also came into the field that day, the landowner. He said to his workers, he said, who is this woman here? And they said, haven't you heard Naomi has returned? And this is her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And Ruth has been helping her make the move back. And Boaz walked up to her and introduced himself. And he says, I've heard, he says, your reputation has preceded you. Ruth got Boaz's attention by coming to his field. We get God's attention when we give him focus, when we come into his field. And Boaz would tell Ruth, he would say, Ruth, there's plenty of food here. You don't have to go anywhere else. Isn't that so true of us today? There's plenty of food here. You don't have to go anywhere else. There's plenty, of, there's plenty to eat. There's plenty to be nourished by. There's plenty of encouragement. Plenty of, uh, plenty of encounters with God right here. He said, don't go anywhere else. And then the word says she came home that night with an overwhelming amount of harvest. And Naomi says, where did you get all this food? And she says, I got it from the field of Boaz. And she said, well, Boaz, Naomi said, well, Boaz is one of my relatives. She said, tomorrow night at, when he's sifting the wheat or when he's, when he's getting rid of all the chaff and getting it ready to eat, she says, I want you to go and find him and lay it, when he's asleep, lay at his feet and, f- lay at his feet and tell him, you are my kinsman, you are my relative, and we need your help. What was the definition of a kinsman redeemer? It's one whose responsibility was to act on behalf of a relative who's in trouble and danger or in need. I don't know if you know this, but before you became a born-again believer, you were in danger. You were in need. You were lacking. And she says, I want you to go down. I want you to humble yourself. Go down to him and just put, over, put his garment over you and say, I've come here for your protection. And the Bible says that middle of the night, he wakes up. He says, who are you? And she said, I'm Ruth, your relative, Naomi's daughter-in-law. She says, we are in need of a redeemer. You are our relative. And he says, but there's a rel-, but he said to her, I know who you are, but there's a relative closer than you. In this story, the relative is never named, but I'm here to tell you, the relative is considered the law. The law is the rel- The law is the first thing we encounter when we come to God. The law is the first thing we see. The law is the pointer sign to Jesus. The law was never meant to redeem us. It has every right to condemn us. It has every right to convict us, but it does not have the ability to save us. And so the word says that he said, hey, tomorrow morning I'm going to go find that other relative. And when I find him, I'm going to ask him if he will take the first turn to redeem you. And the word says he met the relative at the gate of the city that next morning And he says, hey, there's this woman named Ruth who's the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Would you redeem their properties? Would you buy it back for them? And the man says, I can buy the property. But then he says, but when you buy the property, you have to redeem the daughter. You have to make her part of your family. And at that point, that individual said, I can't do that. At that point, the law realizes that only Jesus can forgive us of sin that only Jesus can pay the actual price. The law can point to Jesus. Jesus becomes our redeemer. And the Bible says that at that point, Boaz took the responsibility 
of redeeming not only Naomi's property for her namesake, for the sake of Elimelech, for the sake of the family, for the sake of Israel, but he would also bring her in as his own wife. And this Ruth would go on to be the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus. She would become part of the lineage of Christ. God made space for her and brought her into his plan of redemption. God makes space for you. God makes space for me. Amen? Today, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Today, there are many of us living in the land of Moab, and we're saying, Lord, where are you? God, I need you. God, I need your help. And he points us to Jesus. He points us, and of course, Jesus points us to heaven because he's preparing a place for us who believe. Amen? But in the meantime, he says, you need a redeemer, a protector, a healer, one who can forgive of every sin. Amen? Is he your kinsman redeemer today? Is he your Lord today? If you will, I'm going to ask the musicians to come, and if you'll stand with me this morning. Where are you living today? I know the Bible says that as believers, we're in this world, but we're not of it. But there may be some of us here today that are still of it. We have not had an encounter with God. We have not made him our redeemer. We have not asked him into our heart. But he's here today because he wants to redeem. He's here today because he wants to save. The law cannot save. Our good works cannot save us. Uh, Everything that we would ever do to earn God's favor does not save us. It is only through Jesus Christ. It is only through him that we can enter into our promised land. Amen? And if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Terry, I don't know Jesus. I don't know him. I need need forgiveness. I need protection. Or you may be here today and maybe you were once in the promised land. Maybe you once knew him, but for whatever reason you have found yourself in Moab. For whatever reason you found yourself at a distance with him and you're saying, today is my day. I want to come back to God. I want to return. God is not just for the new believer, but God is for the one who has left and wants to return. Amen? He is the God of second chances. And so if that's, a, if that's you here today, would you slip up a hand and say, yes, that's me? Whether for the first time, yes. Whether for the first time or, you want to, or you're returning and saying, God, I need you. I'm living in a place of famine. I'm living in a place far from you. I need you today. Would there be anybody else? I saw hands going up over here. Anyone else? Yes. 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 Anyone else? Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Can I ask you to do one more thing? Having raised your hand, would you, maybe someone with you, step out in the aisle and just come and we're about to celebrate with you God's salvation. We're about to celebrate. The Bible says that even when when one person makes that decision, that all the angels rejoice. And that's a lot of angels. <laughs> That's a perpetual party. And we want to rejoice with you here this morning. And if you're one that raised your hand, or if you didn't raise your hand, but you want to step out, I have prayer team members that are here waiting for you this morning that will pray with you as well. But would you come and join me right now? I'm going to give it a moment. But would you just step out in the aisle and just say, yes, I want to come forward. I want to make that decision today in Jesus' name. Can we just give God praise this morning? Anyone else? I saw more hands going up. Amen. Would you pray this prayer with me this morning? It's a prayer of redemption, a prayer of salvation. 
But pray this prayer with me, everyone. Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for being my redeemer. I come under your protection. I come under your redemption. I ask you to forgive me, save me, heal me, make me into a new person, a new creation from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Can we give God praise here today? <laughs> praise God. If you prayed that prayer this morning, there's, you can scan this as well, but we want to connect with you. Today is the, this is not cliche, but today is the first day of the rest of your life, the first day in Christ, because to know him is to know joy. To know him is to know peace. To know him is to know that when you lay your head on the pillow at night, that you are protected, uh, that he, that you are covered by our kinsman redeemer. Amen that you can sleep well. I love that part about the story. Boaz said, just stay here and sleep because I, I will take care of this. Jesus took care of us 2,000 years ago. He took care of our need for forgiveness 2,000 years ago. And he says, just stay right here and I'll take care of it. And he did, amen. And so Lord, I just thank you this morning. I thank you, Lord, for all who've raised their hands, all who came forward just now. Lord, you are our kinsman redeemer. And I ask in Jesus' name, dear God, that you would, dear God, these words that have been spoken, that you would solidify them in our hearts, Lord, that no thing or no one can convince us otherwise. Our lives have been changed because of Jesus. Our future is hopeful because of Jesus. Dear God, we know that we can rest well because of you. And so, God, we give you praise in it in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen and amen, amen. In closing, we're going to take a moment of worship here. If you want to come around the altar, you can take time to pray if you wish. Or if you want prayer for anything else. But let us rejoice in this day that we celebrate his resurrection. And how many of you know that every day is resurrection day? Because he lives, we can live also. Amen. Every morning that you wake up, you're, you're waking up with resurrection power. You're waking up with resurrection authority, resurrection peace, resurrection joy, resurrection healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.